to have the light, to have his strength and power to draw from when we need help and when we need guidance. And that there is an awesome conflict going on between God and Satan. And that when you enlist, when you partake of him, that spiritually at the foot of that cross, you realize it's not a game. And you're not playing church. It's a reality. And you, as you look up spiritually or making your mind up, are you going to heaven or are you going to hell? It's your choice. Your decision. It's how you sail your boat, your Christian boat, in life. So it becomes a very serious thing. That, is not, that does not take away from our joy. That does not take away from the celebration of our great gift that he has given us. But you need to be worth something. You need to stand for something, else you're a wet noodle. You're really not much of anything if you don't make a stand. As many would say, well, what kind of conflict are you talking about? Where are you? Do you not listen to the news? They're trying to remove God from our vocabulary. They're trying to take God out of the law itself when the law comes from God. And the, the biggest enemy that Satan has pulled upon us is politically correctness. You see, it's not politically correct for you to object that they're taking God from our vocabulary. Then, as a Christian, or as any religion that believes in God, what good are you if you don't say, whoa, ho? I draw a line, that's it, it's said, I don't care if it offends you. You know, in this country we have freedom of religion. And everyone has the freedom here to worship their God. You try to take our God away from us and you can go back where you came from. We don't need you. That's the way it works here. You have freedom to do what you want. But don't try to push or take away the rights of someone to worship as they feel free to worship. That is the teachings of Jesus Christ. That's what he taught, and that's what the difference makes. That's why it's so serious for you to stay at the front. Did he not say, if you follow me, take up your cross? Do you, know what the, do you think the cross is some little thing you wear around your neck? Do you know what the cross was used for? It was used to crucify people on. What he's saying is, if you believe in me, I'm not going to ask you to do it. I've done it for you, but you better be willing to do it. You better draw a line. And you better say, I stand for something. I stand for the truth. They can try to remove God from our vocabulary. They can wish on. It is not going to happen. They cannot tell us when we can pray and when we cannot pray. God can read your mind. You can pray anytime you want to. If they don't like it, hey, hang it. You know? Legality is a wonderful thing. Just like this past week, we had one of our troops that had to make a pretty strong stand to save some lives. The legal department comes on and said, we have to be the good guys. Hey, when you go to war... And being a participant of World War II in the Korean conflict, I can tell you there is a different law on the field of battle. It's called kill or be killed. And you better be praying that God is with you because he always has been with the Christian armies. Always has been. And we thank our Father for that. So what is legal in peacetime doesn't necessarily apply to the conflict. And spiritually speaking, we're going to turn all that over and think of it in a spiritual way. You're at war. And you better realize that. And you better realize how serious it is when they try to take your rights away from you. I don't know what you fit for. Well, I, I really don't care what they say if they want to do Well, I do. 
I care a great deal when they try to mock Christ. I care a great deal when they try to change history to fit their own rules and regulations. So, what do we do? We fight the good fight. Open your Bibles, if you would, to the great book of Luke, chapter 13. We're going to be dealing with two Greek words today. From They are basically the prime, the adzo, which means uh, to force or to, to uh, crowd oneself into, to be seized. That's what Christianity does to you. That's what Christ does to you. He reaches out. He takes you and he causes you to want to change and to change for others because it's for the better. And it is part of that battle. The, the other Greek word we're, I want to utilize today, uh, uh, which is the prime, aquan, aguan, A-G-O-N. And what it means is, is conflict, a place for competition. I mean, it's, it's, it's a battle, it's a ring, or it's a war. And uh, I will be explaining those words as they are utilized and translated into one form or the other. Jesus begins teaching here in Luke chapter 13, and he says, Hey, what about those 18 that the Tower of Siloam fell on? Were they sinners above all other people? What caused it to happen? It just happened. Okay, They were in the wrong place at the wrong time. <laughs> it killed them. It had nothing to do was whether they were great sinners or not. Eighteen is bondage. It symbolizes bondage. If you allow yourself to come under the bondage of men, and your thought process, you're in a heap of hurt. It will spiritually bring about your death, just like it did the eighteen, whether they sinned or not, at the Tower of Siloam. That was as he led into this particular chapter. And he told, he then began to tell what heaven was like, what his kingdom was, how he did business. Do you understand? King done. The king which he is and the dominion which he rules over. What he's telling you, this is how I do business. There was a woman. She'd been in their bondage for 18 years in sickness. And he healed her. And boy, did they come down on his case because it was the Sabbath. And then he said, if one of you had an animal in a ditch, would you not put... Oh, well, yes, that's a... You know, of course. But what about that woman? Don't be in bondage. Don't allow yourself to be entailed or taken in to be a, uh, in bondage to man's teachings and, doc, uh, and doctrines. For, well, how do I know? Right here, the Word of God, in the simplicity in which it is written, that's how you know, and that's how you come out of bondage. And he begins to tell this after three different, three, four different cases of bondage here in this 13th chapter. Pick it up in verse um, 23. Luke 13. Chapter 13, verse 23. Then said one of his, one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, there, there are just a few. You know, it sounds to me like it's going to be pretty hard to make it. Now, this has to do with his turn, t- return and salvation. Let me ask you a question. How many people do you know? But no, the Spirit's Messiah is coming first, and you're not going to worship Him. How many people do you know in the world that know that? Or how many people do you know that are waiting to fly away? Okay, Because they've been told that. All right? So, what does it mean then? There's not a whole bunch going to make it on the first trip, friend. Thus he answers, verse 24, strive, that word is 
from Adon. The word I told you about it means fight, strive, wrestle, contend, and it means against an enemy. Fight, strive to enter in at the straight gate, for many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. They're not going to make it. But they say they love the Lord. That doesn't matter. Who is their Lord? The one that's going to fly them away? He's coming all right, and he's got the message. His message is, according to Ezekiel chapter 13, verse beginning with verse 18, after they covered the outreaching arms of Almighty God to sew arm pillows to cover the truth so that they taught them to fly to save their souls. Luke, uh, uh, Ezekiel chapter 13, beginning reading with verse 18, that's documented in God's Word. He says, I'm against it. Why? He wants people that will make a stand, spiritually speaking. That make a difference. Well, what, what, what does that mean? That love Him. That really care. They're not worried about self so much. Because they know, and you know, that when you follow Him and dedicate yourself to Him, we draw our strength from Him and our blessings flow from Him, and you're going to be blessed right out of your bonnet, whether you own a bonnet or not. He's going to take care of you if you're willing to make a stand, to make a difference, to represent Him in truth, not fairy tales. Not traditions of men. His doctrine. He said that old gate is pretty narrow. Now, it isn't, it's, that gate is as wide as the international freeways. If you've studied the truth. But if you don't, you're blind. And you're going to be deceived if you're not real careful. That's what he's warning about. Don't be in bondage to the traditions of man's religion. That's what Christ is teaching here. He went through 18, several sets of 18 to get the point across. Even down to the religious community chewing him out because he made a woman whole. What kind of religion is that? That would not God's blessings on someone to make them well. And then he continues and after saying, fight, strive, wrestle with it. Verse 25. When once the master of the house is risen up and hath shut the door to the door, and you begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence you are. Now, Let's end. Well, why would God do? Why would Jesus do that? Well, He put it in terms that we can all understand. He said, "I want a virgin bride, spiritually speaking." Now, if you've been out here, if the false Messiah came first, and you've been out here licking his boots and jumping in his bed for five months, and you expect Revelation chapter nine documentation. And you expect Jesus to take you as a virgin bride, he would have holes in his head if that were to be the case. And that's not sacrilegious. He, Christ is not a fool. And he teaches truth. So, what is he going to say to him? If they had really taught his word, if they have taught it in truth, and if they have remained true, he's going to open that door and take them in. But if they have messed around with the false doctrine, he says to them, verse 26, Then shall you begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence. We take communion with you, Lord, and thou hast taught in our streets. We followed your teachings. 27, But he shall say, I tell you, I know ye not whence you are. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. He says, I, iniquity means sin. I find you guilty, is what he's saying. Guilty of what? Following the wrong teachings. That's what they were doing in the prior verses here. That's why he threw the 18s at them, bondage. You've got yourself all bound up with Satan's malarkey. 
and the teachings of man that make void the word of God. He said, you, don't, you can't come in because you're guilty as sin. Verse 28. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourself thrust out. Now, there's a time set there in that if you just open your minds up and look real close at it, what does it mean? Well, when will you be able to see Abraham? And when will you be able to see Isaac? When you're in that dimension. So it means the seventh trump is sounded. Christ is returned. And he's saying, get out of my sight. He said, I don't want you in here. You're out. So you see, it's a very serious thing. Well, does that mean Christ is loving? Yeah, if you love him. But he's not a fool. If you're going to mess around hanky in with the false Messiah, who wants you to love him, and then expect Christ to have you, you're kidding yourself. I mean, even, this is why he, it would say in Mark 13, Woe to you that are with child when I return. It didn't mean a mother carrying a child. It means someone spiritually impregnated with the false Christ already attended a wedding. And then expect Jesus to pick them up and take them. Or to give suck is what it said. Even nursing along Satan's church. Because he said he's Christ. Well, then isn't that a Christian church? No. What does Christ say in Mark 13? He said, there's many going to come in my name claiming to be Christ. I'll be a Christian preacher. Yes, sir, read Bob. You know, just, well, we need to do something religious before we get started. Let's get the plates out and pass them here, okay? You all know I won't allow a plate to be passed. Because that's not religious. That's your business, okay? But that's what they have in mind. They kind of chase money instead of God's Word. And if they only knew, if you teach God's Word, you'll have more money than you know what to do with to try to keep up the, the ministry going, outreaching. He takes care of his own. He does. When you take care of his business, he takes care of yours, all right? But if you're going to try to play church, and if you're going to try to, if you won't make a stand, if you won't fight, if you can stand at that cross and say, it's all for me, ain't I something? Think about that a minute if that's the frame of mind you have. He did it for me. Well, really, that's true. He did. Now, what are you going to give him in return? Do you like one of these love affairs where everyone that your mate comes is all you? You don't you don't think you have to give anything in return? Do you think Christ is a fool? He expects something in return. And understand, I'm speaking spiritually here. He expects you to love him and be able to make a stand, to stand for something. That when someone tries to drive God's name out of our vocabulary, that the hair on the back of your neck stands up. It irks you to see Satan toying with people. And you can't help it. It's just natural when you have Christ in you. That makes a difference. Verse 28. We got that. Okay, 29. And they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. That's God's elect. That's those that do know the truth and that stay true, that do make a difference. And he knows even what you're thinking, beloved. All right? And behold, there are last which shall be first and there are first which shall be last. Many... Of, that are in the last generation were chosen in the first earth age. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4. Before the foundations of the world, I chose you when you stood against Satan. You earned it. He didn't give it to you for free. Not because you're the prettiest. 
in, in Jeremiah chapter 1, the first six verses, he said to Jeremiah, I knew you before you were in your mother's womb. Therefore, I'm choosing you as a prophet. Because why? I know you can cut it. I knew you from there. Well, you mean we were with God? Well, do you think you were hatched? Are you a, a, an environment? I'm sorry to say an environmentalist. Well, that's about as bad. But there's a lot of good people that, pray, but they, you know, they don't realize that the Communist Party has moved into the Green Party, and you better be real careful, okay? Um, so, you know, um, our father expects his children to be like him and to bless him, to follow him. To care. And you've, maybe you some of you have a neighbor that is, I just really don't care. I, I, as long as I could punch the clock and draw my check and go fishing, I could care less. That's sad, my friends. Lord only knows how can you help a person like that by setting an example. Yeah, fight the good fight. It's well worth it. When you stand at the foot of the cross, realize how serious it is, along with the joy. I don't want to take away your joy. But at the same time, I want you to realize that they cannot take his name from us. It won't work. We will not stand for it. And we will have, we will pray to God to bring 10,000 angels down on their selves and fix their nest. And you have the power and the authority to make that prayer. When you believe upon Him and you strive, you fight the good fight, you make a difference. Uh, turn with me to chapter 16 in this great book. Luke chapter 16. Might back back up a little bit to verse 10 there. We're going to start with 14 so that you realize, though, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If you won't make a stand for little things, if you don't have the faith to believe in God, then he's not going to trust you with the big things. I guarantee it. Now, to pick this thought up, uh, let's drop on down to 14. And the Pharisees also who were covered, this had to do with money, okay, and what people will do with money. And the Pharisees also who were covetous, what does that mean? They love money more than anything else. Heard all these things, and they derided him. Why? They loved their money. Now, there's nothing, don't you ever apologize for being rich. Okay. God expects his people to be rich. If you have worked and you have earned that without false gains, all God hates is you that are rich with ripping off your brother. Okay? That's wrong. And you'll never have peace of mind because you're always going to be looking over your shoulder. Rob a bank and take ten million dollars. Ten million is not really all that much anymore. It's more than I got. Told. <laughs> but if you, if you had that ten million, you wouldn't sleep at night. You would be listening for that doorbell to ring. You would be for somebody to break it down. You know. So, but never apologize. But don't love money. Okay. Love the Lord more. Amen. See. Because that is what he wants. That's what he wants you to do. This is why that in, in uh, Luke chapter 14, if we were to go there, it says, unfortunately mistranslated, that you've got to hate your mother, father, father, brother, wife, and so the word in the Greek means love less. You've got to love them less than you do Jesus Christ. Why? 
He died for you. He was on that cross. What chance would you have if it were not for him? So don't love money. Love him. And, uh, and never apologize for wealth. It's just not necessary. It's where, it's where your mind is, where your love is, okay? Fifteen. And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men. That's all you care about. But God knoweth your hearts. I, he knows what you're thinking. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. When people would love mammon more than God, he finds it abominable. I mean, why? Why would? Well, how far do you think when you stand at the foot of the cross and you just are making your trip for deciding to go to heaven or hell, how much do you think you're going to buy your way in? How, how valuable will mammon be to mammon money be to you there? None at all. If it's where your love is, do you understand where I'm coming from, okay? That is an abomination if you love men's things more than God. You're going to let them take his name out of your vocabulary? Because you might offend someone, dear one. You, they might consider it to be rude. Well, who gives anything about that? Who, you know, in Oklahoma, we have a saying for that. We say, who gives a hoot? You ever heard an old hoot owl? They don't hoot about much, but they do hoot. I don't give a hoot if God's name offends somebody. All right? They better listen to it. Verse 16, the law and the prophets were until John. I mean, they warned, they cried the warning. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached and every man pressed into it. Pressed is from the uh, base root of, um, of uh, uh, by, ag, by, bizil, okay? which means to be seized by God. You can't help yourself. He reaches down and gets hold of your little old heart. You know, some of them are big and some of them are little. And he twists it and turns it to where you're loyal to him. You can't, you can't, hardly, you can't hardly help yourself for wanting to, to serve uh, him. The Advil, he loves you. And he wants you to be pressed into his service to where you... Press means, I'm here, I'm a soldier of Christ, and I'm ready. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now, this is Paul, Paul the Apostle, and he says, For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. It wasn't empty. It wasn't just to say, hey... It was for a purpose. It was to accomplish something. Verse 2. But even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. And here we have Adzuma again. Contention. Well, it wasn't. Well, I thought if you preached, they just all clapped their hands and it was just dandy time. <laughs> you ever done any preaching? It, it doesn't work that way necessarily in the world. Okay. Now, if you're shut up in a closet somewhere preaching to believers, that's fine. But when you're preaching to new converts and you're preaching out in the world, broadcasting, let's say, I guarantee you. You're going to be thrashed here and there, and hopefully you'll have a thick skin. And you'll say, God forgive them, for they know not what they do. Idiots. <laughs> <laughs> they can't help it. They don't know. All right? Seriously speaking, okay? But what happened at Philippi? Well, this great fight was going on. Hey, he was preaching the gospel, and they beat him beat his buddies, they threw him in jail, 
the Roman soldiers did, and I mean they put them under lock and key and said, you keep them there. Now Paul, a servant of God, is a Roman citizen. Do you know what happens to a Roman general that beats a Roman citizen publicly without a trial? He's in deep, deep trouble. So Paul, and then they're down at the jail singing, and an earthquake comes along. I mean, it knocks the doors off the place, the shackles fall loose, and the jailer is ready to commit suicide because he knows Paul and them are gone and they're going to kill him over it. And Paul said, don't do that. Stay that sword. Because we're still here. And the jailer said, what must I do to be saved? Paul and preached to him. His whole family was converted. So you see, from contention, we make hay while the sun shines. Okay? God was in control. It come daylight. And the jailer was kind of concerned what he was going to do. And the leader sent word, let those men go. And Paul said, no, 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 don't go no such a big hurry here. Let them come and tell us. Because he knew they were in trouble. Okay. He was a Roman citizen, and they had beat him, flogged him. Caesar would be on their case like, well, I won't say it. Sorry to. My old sayings are just popping right out here, and I think I better withhold some of them. It's not politically correct. <laughs> oh, it is to me, but whatever, okay? I mean, they were scared. They had messed up. And finally, uh, Paul was gracious enough. He, he just, he had accomplished what he wanted. He saved two or three families. Uh, the Lord did, through Paul. He had accomplished what he wanted. The Word reigned supreme. Think about that in your own life. That's why you strive. That's why you're oppressed and seized. You can't help it. You have to make a stand. I'm, if you think I'm telling you you need to become a religious fanatic, you don't know me very well. You work in a cool, slow, methodical manner. You get it done when it's too deep for everybody else to plow just the way we like it. Okay? Be well enough informed in God's Word that you can do that. Because you're going to, sooner or later, if you decide to teach, they're going to, well, we're going to bring you down here and drag you over the coals. Hey, let's go. We're going to question you. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. Let's get it on. All right? So you want to be well informed. As, as best you can in God's Word. And he said there was a lot of contention there. And so there was. You can read of all that in Acts chapter 16 if you want to make a side note. Verse 3 as we continue. Chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanliness, nor in guile. Our exhortation was the Word of God. Chapter by chapter and verse by verse. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, with what? Gospel, what's that? Good news. Even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. Do you know what that word trieth means? If you did, you probably, I think it was my last lecture. It's to assay. It's like, like where they take slag and gold and stuff and put it in a furnace and melt that down to see how much good stuff is there. That's what God does to you. Now, I don't like to be tested necessarily. I, well, you should enjoy it. Because if you've got some good stuff down there, he's going to find it. All right? God will test us. Well, then what does he test us for? To see if you can cut it. To see if you can contend. To see if he can trust you. To see if you love him. To see if you're willing to make a stand. To see if you care whether God is removed from your vocabulary. Does it make a difference? You bet it does. I'll tell you, um, 
I think I'm gonna, I, you never should personalize something. But for an old combat marine, the things that are happening right now are bothering me a great, great deal. You know, some of us old boys from World War II and the Korean conflict know how to take care of business. And there's a lot of things right now we could be taking care of business where they're just talking. And, but the most serious thing, now listen to me carefully, that might be good for an old combat marine to not like what they're doing to our children. Because maybe he thinks he knows how to take care of business a little better. You don't believe it. Let them, let them hit one of our humbies and then come around throwing rocks at it and shooting at it. Do you know what that means? They hate your guts. That's the ones you want to get rid of. Teach a little respect and dignity, rules of war. Okay, now I won't go any further with that. But what's more serious, far more serious than that, is Christians that won't make a stand concerning the name of God. The Ten Commandments in a courthouse where law is supposed to be administered. That we let a lot of eagle beagle, legal beagles that haven't got enough sense to pour water out a window. Is that the way that goes? I think that's what that and this is the way it should be. Well, it's, what's right is right and what's wrong is wrong, period. When it comes to dealing with the name of our Father, okay? So uh, where was I here? I, that's the most serious thing is to not make a stand for God, okay? Now, um, what we taught was we didn't try to please men. You should try to please men. No, you shouldn't. You should please God, and it will please the men you should care about. You got it? That, there's so much love in what I just stated. Some people could take that the wrong way. But if you go around trying to please men, most of them don't want to hear the Word of God, friend. So what are you going to do? You're not going to do it. That's why. So if you teach the Word and the men are drawn to that Word as it is written, then you've accomplished something, okay? You please God and those that God would have it to please. Verse 5, For neither at any time used we flattering words, as you, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness. We didn't just try to say things pleasing to men. We taught it the way it was, okay? And beloved, that's the way it should be. And, and you're, you're going to have people that are going to say, but well, you might drive somebody away. Well, good. If they can't stand the truth, you don't want them there anyway, okay? They, they'll cause you trouble. They will disrupt your class, all right? Well, but don't you want them saved? Of course. But there's some not fit to save just yet. But we've got the millennium coming, and the love of Christ is supreme. But when you have people that have tender ears, don't let the wolves rip the ears off, okay? The word of the wise is sufficient. Verse 6, Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. We didn't seek any praise from you. We only want you to... And you shouldn't. You should praise God. You should stand at the foot of that cross and praise Him. He's the one that brought all this to us. He is the one that makes it possible in your life to say, Father, I need strength. And He gives it to you. He touches you. And you have that strength. If you're His child, why wouldn't He? Verse 7, But we were gentle among you even as a nurse cherisheth her child. You can't... A mother nursing her child, you can't find anything more tender and loving than that. Okay, it's the picture, the essence of love. Eight, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted into you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. That's Christian love. That's family. That's caring, all right? That means putting man aside 
and thinking about our Father's Word and how desperately, desperately, desperately it is needed in this world today. Let me tell you something. God has given us a platform that goes into millions and millions of homes. Let me tell you, they're starving. They're hungry. They're starving for truth. The truth. Well, what's the truth? God's Word. And they are attuned to it. Those that have eyes to see and ears to hear. It's time. It's the season. And that love needs to go forth. Verse 9, For you remember, brethren, our labor and prevail for laboring night and day. Well, I don't know if I want to start preaching if you've got to work night and day. I want to get some of that easy money. You know, I heard a man say that one time. I'm going to go... Uh, do I want to say what's... I'm going to the Methodist seminary so I can be a Methodist preacher and get in on some of that easy money. And I told him, I said, I think you're thinking about the wrong reasons for teaching God's Word. Well, he didn't last. I don't think he even made it through seminary. Uh, labor and night and day, Paul never took a salary, okay? He practiced his own trade. Because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. Ten, ye are witnesses. And God also, how holy and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. That's the way teachers should do. And that's the way you should do. You're going to be abused, my friends. You're going to be insulted. But don't let that don't let that hack you off, okay? They a lot of most time often they don't know what they're doing. Now, I have some interesting things written about me that I've never experienced. Thank God. But uh, I don't know how I got left out of the story, but they seem to like to write about it. And what I'm saying is it's pretty rough stuff. But ignore it. Never let it prevent you from teaching the love of Christ in Christ. Love. Don't let them steal your your praise for the Father. Verse 11. As you know how we exhorted and com, com, uh, comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his, doth his children, treated you like our own, and spiritually they were, that we would walk worthily of God, who has called you, I underline that in your mind, who has called you. I thought I volunteered. Some of you he called, and he had a reason for it. Some of you knew and know you have a destiny and a purpose. And you've known it since you were a little pumpkin. All right? But God had something special for you. It's called his word. All right? have called you unto his kingdom and glory. And for this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men. Don't, don't listen to the word of men, my friend, unless it's a business deal. It has nothing to do with church. But as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectively worketh also in you that believe. Follow those that believe. All right. Timothy. Poor little old Timothy. We're going to go over there. Same thing. Go with me to 1 Timothy. Chapter 6. into the world, when you visit churches and you talk with people, you're going to find all kinds of doctrines. How do you know true doctrine? It's whether it aligns with God's Word. It's that simple. It's not, it's, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know if someone's teaching falsely. Chapter 6, verse 3, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. He is proud. That means he's puffed up. He's a fool. 
knowingly, knowing nothing, and he'll tell you he knows everything. All right? He knows nothing. But doting about questions and strifes of words kind of sick in the mind. Also a fool, if you would. Whereof cometh, what does it bring forth? Well, lock it down. Envy, strife, quarreling, evil surmisings. Do you want to surmise something? Surmise it from God's Word. This is to say evil surmisings. This is to say conclusions drawn with no evidence. Don't you ever listen to someone teach that does not document or bring forth the evidence from God's Word of exactly what is being taught. It won't stand. It will fall. It is no good. Five, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing they that gain is godliness, from which withdraw thyself. In other words, they're going to pass the plate and beg half the time. All right? You can count on it. That's, that's, that's what it amounts to. Six, but godliness, on the other hand, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Uh, self Sufficiency is contentment, all right? Self-sufficiency, that is one that you haven't made something up. You didn't draw it out of the dark, the blue, but you documented it and built a solid foundation on the rock. And that rock is Christ and His Word. I'm sorry, friend, you, you can get hooked up with some wrong people. Do they mean well? That's, we don't have to judge them, all right? You are to spiritually discern from the Word of God. And what do you do about it? Well, you have to make your own mind up. Verse 7. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And that is true with the exception of one thing that does go out with you. And the documentation for it is Revelation chapter 14, verse 13. Your works do follow you. And you don't necessarily take them, they follow you. I got a pretty good reason why it says there they can follow you because it's already there in the book. Alright. You got it written right down here in the book. Alright. Uh, but um, you can't. So you, you're not, what, what his point is, what do you, what do you want to worry about building something up so fantastic here in this dispensation? Because you were born naked, you didn't have nothing, and most likely, I could take that one step further, if you don't have any righteous acts, you're going to be naked in heaven also. And that's kind of a bad shape, friend. You ain't got nothing here, and ain't going to have nothing there. Love Him. Follow Him. Let Him uh, be where your interest lies in serving Him. And pleasing him, not men. Verse 8, And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Uh, you, don't, you don't need, don't, don't, be, don't be over anxious. Don't worry, okay? You get a lot of worry warts, and boy, I mean, if they don't have everything laid out just right, just, boy, get that worry hat. Get my worry bonnet out. It won't help. It's a waste of time. Trust God, okay? Verse 9, But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which draw men in destruction and perdition. Uh, you know, I would hope that everyone in this room could be rich without that happening to them. It is true that probably wealth makes temptations fall easier in your face, but then... Um, it shouldn't. It really shouldn't. Why wouldn't riches... Riches are God's blessings. 
God's blessing should be exactly that to you. A blessing, not something harmful. So, do you understand what I'm saying? It's a frame of mind. Strictly a frame of mind. That if you have God's blessings, thank Him for it, but don't lose sight of what is important. And that's helping others. Okay, and, and let me, let me say, you don't, I'm not talking about helping them with your riches. Helping them with the Word of God, which is the true riches of the world. Um, verse, I, okay, 10, did we get there? For the love of money is the root of all evil, which, while some coveted after, which some coveted after, they loved it. In fact, came first. They have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You don't, it's such a waste to love money, okay? Um, and I'm not going to go there, but uh, I'm going to tell you something. A lot of, if you have a roof, if you have, verse 8, having food and raiment, if you've got clothing, you've got what you need, if, if you're really, really wealthy, you've got to worry about, well, what am I going to do about taxes now? And what am I going to, where am I going to invest this? And where am I going to invest that? And who's going to try to rip me off here? And who's going to try to rip me off there? It's not Happy Jack, all right? It's not necessarily what some people would choose it to be. The riches of God are fantastic, and those that have them know how to handle it, I suppose. Verse 11. But thou, O man of God, flee these things. Keep away from them. And follow after righteousness, godliness, uh, faith, love, patience, and meekness. You know what? That builds character. That's what you want to have. That makes you somebody. That makes you different. That makes you, when you walk in a room, people can notice. Verse 12. This is why we came here. Fight the good fight. And that's the title of this lecture. This is a gun again. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Don't choose hell. Don't choose death. Whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. So, how beautiful the fight is. Paul fought the good fight. As a matter of fact, we're going to, we're going to go there in closing, for he did fight the good fight. Second Timothy, for those of you that don't know, Second Timothy comes after First Timothy. <laughs> I'm checking to see if people are awake here. And in Second Timothy, we're going to take chapter four. And we're going to pick it up with verse 1. This was supposed to be a very short lecture today. Uh, so let's just get right to it, okay? Chapter 4, 2 Timothy, verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's pretty serious, my friend. Who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. When he comes back, that's his duty, is to judge. Preach the word. Be instant in season, rightly dividing the word, okay? Out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Now, they didn't say, you be a sweet little preacher, go down there and please what men say, ride bicycles or whatever it takes to get them in there. Put a $5 bill under some of the chairs. I actually knew a man that did that. <laughs> to get people to come to church, if you're that hard up for students, you're not a teacher. Teachers don't have to beg people to come. They come. Okay. Exhort. By what? Teaching God's Word as it is written. Making no excuses or apologies to anyone. Rightly dividing the Word in season and out. Three. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. That's to say teachers that will, that will t say nice things to them. I just feel a blessing for you today, dear one. You may not know them from come second. 
you're such a sweet person. Well, how do you know? Do you, or why are you judging them? Or, you know, uh, sweet things are God's word taught. Okay, don't listen to a man please her. All right. Uh, don't listen to somebody that just tickles ears. Okay. Four. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned in, into fables. That's the sad part, my friend. False doctrine, which sends people to hell. That's bad. Very bad. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. You do your homework. Don't, you know, don't, don't copy some other man. Did you hear what I said? Don't copy some other man's gift. Study God's Word and do it yourself. Alright? Because if you're not careful, then the next thing you know, you'll be teaching the man instead of the Word of God. You got it? Teach God's Word, not man's Word. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. That's what uh, Paul is saying here. Verse 7, why we came here. I have fought a good fight. And that's from Paul. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but all, unto all them also that love his appearing. Do you? Are you going to love to see his appearing? If you've been worshiping the false Messiah, you're not going to love it. Okay? But you're going to be glad to see him when he comes. Paul says, I fought the good fight. Well, he was sure a sweet preacher. He was beaten, shipwrecked, received one minus 40 stripes, many times saying, I thought for sure we were going to die, and all I could do was put it in God's hands. He fought the good fight. Now, thank goodness we're not put, we're not exposed yet to that kind of those kind of things. But you are exposed to ridicule, mocked, and so forth when you really make a stand for God. I don't know. Do you want that crown? It's yours. All you got to do is earn it. You thought I was going to say claim it, didn't you? You've got to earn it. Okay. Paul did. Well, how did Paul earn it? Fighting the good fight. Making a difference. They cannot take God out of our vocabulary. He is our Father. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for the privilege of serving you. We thank you for that privilege. Let all these be a blessing to whom they come in contact with. In Jesus' name, amen. Are you a new listener to Shepherd's Chapel? We know at first glance the Bible may seem a little overwhelming. You may have asked yourself, where do I start? That is why we at Shepherd's Chapel developed a list of suggested tapes for new students. The suggested tapes for new students form the building blocks, a solid foundation on which you can then build your understanding of God's letter to you, the Bible. The suggested tapes for new students are listed on the third page of your monthly newsletter. You may order these tapes by completing our order form and sending a check or money order to cover the suggested donation of $4 per tape. You may also place credit card orders for Shepherd's Chapel materials by calling 1-800-643-4645 24 hours a day. Our friendly operators stand ready to assist you with your order. Get started on the road to understanding God's Word. The road begins with the suggested tapes for new students.
Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're going to get back into our Father's Word, Book of Ezekiel. Very important that you remember in the last lecture, God is discussing Tyre, Tyrus. What does that word mean in the Hebrew tongue? Rock. But it's certainly not our rock. It's Satan. And he had the little island of Tyrus as his world cargo market. I mean, that's all of his trade, the ships of Tarshish. And, and in this 27th chapter, God is using the analogy of describing Tarshish as a boat or a ship, more correctly said. And speaking of how he traded around the 